All right. Okay. Jean, are you ready to be I'm, counted I'm in? ready, Mommy. Okay. Ready in Chamesh. Arba, Shalosh, Stein. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Where my mom's, where my mom's, where my mom's at? Where my mom's wearing thongs, hitting bongs at? Raising kids, cleaning shits, need a long nap. Where my mom's, where my mom's, where my mom's at? Where my mom's at podcast. <laughs> With Christina P. Oh, oh my goodness. I have such a treat for you listeners. All you moms and mommies and daddies. Dr. Deborah So is here with me. She wrote The End of Gender, which is about not what you think it's about. <laughs> which is why she's here with us. Welcome, Deborah So, Thank you. doctor. Thank you for having me. Man. Let me tell you, I, I just think you're brilliant. I heard you on Joe Rogan, and then I heard you with Dr. Drew, and then I bought your book, The End of Gender. I bought the physical copy. It sits on my nightstand. I have the Audible book. I listen to it in the car. I've given it to other people. You're just, I think you're so goddamn smart, and I just hope I'm smart enough to talk to you today. (laughs) (laughs) I think you give me way too much credit. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here, and thank you. So you have a PhD in the neuroscience of sex. Mm -hmm. And now you currently work as a journalist. Yes. So your book, it's so controversial. You've been pulled off the shelves at Walmart. People are so mad. Why is everybody so mad at sweet Dr. Deborah So? (laughs) You'll have to ask them. I really don't know. Anyone who reads the book tells me, they say, I don't understand why this is seen as controversial. I don't understand why people say you're hateful. You're so reasonable. The book is so balanced and compassionate. I think a lot of it is that people who have not read my work, they have no idea what I have to say about it. They have no idea what I stand for. It's much easier to demonize someone like me instead of taking the time to actually understand my argument or to read the research that I cite. And I think at some level, because I challenge this orthodoxy, the only way they can really argue with it because they don't have a point, they can't argue with the research, is to shut me down or to call me names. So that's, that's my understanding. But I, I, it does, it has been a relief to me to hear people like you. I mean, I, I'm so grateful to you being willing to have me on and people giving me a fair chance and not judging me based on what other people say. Because I do think if you actually take the time to read The End of Gender, you'll see that it's not what people say it is. It's not hateful. Uh, by the way, and, and might I point out is that I, there's so many similarities I feel you and I have, I have a PhD and awesome too, but no, no, but it is a, you, <laughs> you do. You, no, you, you're like, you, you said before you are, grew up kind of with a punk ethic, as did I, a DIY, and that you were, were um, a supporter of the gay community. You grew up with gay men teaching you mm-hmm. how to be subversive and fun. And like, you're, you're a huge proponent of, of this community. So like people, first of all, let's start with the compassion. And I feel that reading your book, the compassion you do have for trans people or whatever, gay people, all of those people, there's like love (laughs) in the book, but okay. So why, why are people, well, let's start from the beginning. You're, I feel like you're Galileo, you're Galileo (laughs) and this Copernican heliocentric model is around and you're like, listen, guys, this is just, this is it. This is the science of it. And everybody's still like, I'm stuck. They're stuck in societal whatever, and they don't want to listen to you and they want to persecute. So, so what are you saying in your book? Let's just start there. That's so outrageous. What do you think people are responding to? In terms of uh, what I'm saying, I mean, like you said, I grew up in the gay community. I really actually credit my friends, my, my gay male friends for making me the woman I am. You know, I'm very proud of that. And I've been a typical like a little bit more male typical which people get upset at me for saying that because they think that when a woman says that 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 you're trying to be cool right or that you're saying that right it's it's not good to be female i'm not saying that at all i'm very proud to be a woman for sure but i'm saying there are some of us who are a little bit different like that and i don't think there's any shame in that either i'm not saying one's better than the other but in terms of um the compassion aspect yeah i think that's very important i have a lot of love for all these communities, for trans people, for intersex people, for anyone with gender dysphoria, anyone who's struggling. And so I don't think the two things are necessarily incompatible in that I think you can criticize this orthodoxy or the dogma or the anti-science movement that's being pushed by people who are really in favor of 
these woke ideas about gender while still being compassionate. And in fact, yes. I have a lot of people who reach out to me from the trans community because I'm not transgender. I never want to seem like I'm speaking for trans people. And they will say they agree with me and they're, they're grateful for the things I say because they say the activists are not representing them. And in many cases, the activists themselves are not transgender. Yeah, that's that seems to be uh, <laughs> talking about this with Ryan Sickler. A lot of angry white ladies. Uh, white <laughs> ladies tend to be <laughs> standing up for everybody. Uh, but I love what you say. So you do say this in your book. So basically, if I, I'm I'm paraphrasing grossly, so please correct me, is that you are having the quote audacity to say that there are two genders. There are these things called gametes, mm-hmm. right? You either produce sperm or eggs and then there's a spectrum in terms of personality right so so you say like you're a male typical female i would identify Mm -hmm. as a male typical female i'm in a male dominated industry i'm very uh you know aggressive whatever Mm -hmm. and so but i but i don't know had i been 15 years old and would somebody have said are you non-binary i might have been like wait a minute yeah because i'm not a typical female yeah maybe i am yeah, I'm like a masculine, so maybe I'm non-binary. So yeah, or yeah, go ahead, go. Or maybe you would think that that means that you should really be a boy because that's another thing that's happening. You see these girls who are slightly masculine who think, well, I'm not stereotypically feminine. I'm not a girly girl. I don't seem to like the same things that girls my age like. So maybe that actually means that I'm supposed to be a boy. And I'm saying no. I mean, maybe that could be, but it could also be that you're just a girl who likes things that boys like, and that's fine too. Right. So what does the research say on this type of stuff? Like how, how many go, like, I know there are definitely, I've, you've, we've all seen those kids that know I am a boy, I'm a boy and I'm in a, the wrong body. I'm in a girl's body. And then they grow up and they're like, oh, what a relief. I'm so glad I transitioned early. And then how many people grow up and are like, oh, I'm glad I didn't transition because I'm like gay, I'm gay or whatever. So this area of research, it's called the desistance literature, and I, it's seen as hugely controversial, and I don't think it should be, or it's seen as, a, it's, some people say it's a myth, it's not. So all of the research that we have on kids with gender dysphoria, so these are kids who, like you said, they feel like they're more like the opposite sex than their birth sex. They will often say that they're born in the wrong body. Um, of all the studies we have following those kids long term, once they hit puberty, they're more likely to grow up to be gay. They're, they're going to desist, so they're not going to feel uncomfortable in their bodies or their birth sex, and they'll be, like you said, happy gay adults. So it doesn't make sense for them to transition prior to puberty, even a social transition, I can explain why. Um, so if you don't let, if you transition those children before puberty, they're not going to go through that process of their feelings of gender dysphoria desisting. Mm. And so I understand why people see this as controversial because it could be used as an argument to say no one should be allowed to transition. I'm definitely not saying that. Um, I do think transitioning can help adults. But I think what happens in this conversation is people who have transitioned, when they look back on their childhood, they see that through the lens of having transitioned and it working for them. So I think in some ways they may be projecting their experiences on these kids and saying, well, because transition worked for me, that's the case for all kids who feel this way or who voice this. And in some kids, especially in today's climate, I feel like parents especially, not necessarily your audience, but I think just parents in general are probably a little bit more sensitive to picking up on these cues because this is such a hot topic and it's everywhere. So if you have a child that says anything related to their gender, parents are quick to, to take that and question maybe this means something and, and that they should listen to the child. Well, in many cases, children, I mean, I'm not a clinician, I don't do work, clinical work anymore and I don't work with these kids. But if I talk to my colleagues who are clinicians or you look at the research, I mean, kids say all kinds of things developmentally. They, they don't know what they're talking about in a lot of cases. And <laughs> you, as a parent, you don't take what they say as, at face value. But when it comes to gender, because this is such a politicized issue and because mm. there are, parents are also being told that their child will commit suicide if they don't transition, which is also not true. So it's become so it's a it's a topic that no one really wants to touch unless they are on board with the the mandated narrative and so as a result this is where we are. How did gender become such a politicized issue and well, I mean your book presents scientific data, scientific research. It's not like you're 
some wackadoo out in the middle of nowhere going, I don't think this stuff is real. You're like, no, 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 this is the research. This is the scientific data. How did we get to such a hysterical point in society where we can't even discuss the possibility of these ideas without being, you know, the, under threat of being canceled? Like, I, I'm, I'm a 90s liberal in a, in a way, like, hey, let's discuss all the ideas. I don't know. Is there something there? Is, you know, let's go with it. So how did, how did we get here with gender? And that's how it should be. Like, I still consider myself to be liberal and even progressive in some ways, but I just have a real issue with science denial. And, and on the topic of gender, it just so happens that most of the science denial is coming from the left. So I think part of it, as someone who was a, is formerly, formerly an academic sex researcher in the field of sex research, there has, it's historically been a fight against conservatives not to say that all conservatives right. have an issue with sex research but that's predominantly where the political interference has been coming from so when it comes from the left or your own side i think sex researchers feel that it's not as serious mm. or that they'll deal with it later and so that's what happened it, it's just grown and then also when it comes to issues around transgender the transgender community or anything about transitioning because there's been a very ugly history mm -hmm. of tension between trans activists and researchers in the book I write about a couple of different examples so sex researchers who are busy enough as is just trying to do good science and stay on top of teaching and the university and everything else that they have to do they don't want to deal with being mobbed on social media or having activists go after them and their families so they just don't say anything about it so that's why the discourse has become so slanted now where anyone you do see talking about this in in the mainstream any so-called experts are going to be on board because they either don't want to upset the activists or they know that saying the right thing is going to help them move their career forward. Right. Wow, man. It's just, it's, it's, it is, it's just wild. And I, I think you really hit the nail on the head in saying that because it comes from your side, you're right. That traditionally, historically, you know, it used to be that we're battling against conservatives. It's the right, it's the Bible, you know, thumpers that don't want, science and don't believe and now when it's on your team you're like oh well maybe there's some is there validity to this um am i am i an a-hole and i think <laughs> like because i really don't want to be on the wrong side of history on this gender stuff and i you know i make fun of um <laughs> i listen man these guys know like I, my mind, I have a joke on my first, on my first Netflix special about non-binary. Cause I, the first time I heard it, I was like, wait, what? Like, wait, what the fuck are you talking about? Like there's, there's no astral gendered and I'm fucking dog. Gender. And then you're like, okay, well, you know what? Pluto is not a planet anymore. Maybe this is one of those things. Like I grew up thinking Pluto was a planet that ain't fucking real. So maybe you know, I'm maybe I'm I'm insensitive, but uh, I don't think I am. I think it's it feels it doesn't it doesn't ring true when when no. you see, there's something going on when you see a kid on TikTok being like I identify as an astral gender non-binary the the, the 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 litany and you're like how do you know that are you sure <laughs> are because I I identified as goth and punk and I get that need to belong to something. Is that what's happening with the kids? Well, see, I think it's good. And I think most people should be open-minded and open to questioning their own previous beliefs and changing your mind, especially if there's new, like as a scientist, in my case, changing my mind based on new information. But when it's information that when you dig beneath the surface and you see it's not what it's presenting itself as, then I think you have a right to call into question. So say with non-binary, I'm very critical of that movement just because I think it's about a whole bunch of things that people aren't actually talking about. And to get called transphobic for questioning the non-binary movement, as I have, I think is totally ridiculous because there's nothing hateful about it. For I think for, in terms of the research I've done and looking at people who identify this way, and I talk about, it, I have a whole book in the, a whole chapter in the book devoted to this. In a lot of cases, it's people who are born female who don't like the idea of being women either because they've experienced sexism or they don't like that they are sexualized in some cases they have sexual trauma they don't like that they've gone through puberty and now they've developed breasts and a more womanly body they don't like the attention they're getting things like that um, or in many cases it's young people who are gay and they're not fully comfortable with the fact that they're gay so if they identify as non-binary suddenly this is exotic 
people think you're interesting. The minute you say that you're non-binary in some social circles, people immediately mm. think, oh, wow, you know, who's this person? There's, some, there's something interesting about them. Yes, it's social currency. Dr. Drew mm. uh, talked to me about that in that form of um, it makes you unique. It makes you stand out. It makes you, di I get it. Like I so, I so understand that as an adolescent. I was, I so wanted that. So this is so great. You've got this great chapter in your book where you go, there are two sexes. There, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, you go non-binary. Non-binary doesn't exist there. I, I said it. And it, it was like, <laughs> and it's so funny because to me, you're saying, you're saying the absolute truth. Like, hey, the stop sign is red. And I can't believe that you're having to be like, no, no, dude, the stop sign is red and you're going to attack me for it. So explain to my listeners what the science says about the genders. Why, why are there, why does non-binary not exist? I have to say, love Dr. Drew, so, super grateful for his support. He's been so kind to me. Um, so in terms of why there are two, so as you mentioned, there are two biological sexes. And biological sex is seen as hateful nowadays, and I don't think it should be. I think yeah. we can talk about biology and sex and reality and still be sensitive towards trans people. So there are two sexes, as you mentioned, and because gender is influenced by biology. So sex is, as you mentioned, gametes, so eggs and sperm. Gender is how we feel in relation to our biological sex. So for 99% of us, our biological sex is our gender. For that 1%, intersex people and trans people may identify as the opposite sex. And then j just to define gender expression, this is just how you express your gender through usually mannerisms or um, your haircut and clothing, things like that. So the reason why there are two genders is because if gender is informed by biology and there are only two sexes, there are no intermediate gametes. So there's nothing in between eggs and sperm. So following from that, there's no intermediate genders. And I, I think at the, the best... I mean, the most charitable interpretation I can take is that there are people who feel like their gender changes over time, sure. But I think we all have that to some extent. I don't think anyone is 100% gender typical or 100% gender atypical. And I think it's actually pretty regressive to say that anyone who's slightly different from their birth sex. So if you're a girl who is slightly gender atypical, that means you're not actually female. That means you're something else in between. Why can't you just be female? Right. And you bring this up in your book, too, that it's um, you, you say that like I used to be a feminist and <laughs> as was I. I mean, I you, you would have met me in college, girl. We, you know, we would have gotten high and, and read Simone de Beauvoir to, we, to each <laughs> other and high fived each other. How feminist and great we are. Yeah. Um, but if that's what feminism means now, you're right. It's anti-feminist because what you're saying is like, no, 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 that's not a trait a female can have to be athletic, masculine, blah, blah, blah whatever, uh, or whatever, alpha. <laughs> that that or belongs. Even good at math, right? So, so, like their girls are now think that because they're good at math, they're not really girls. <laughs> I'm thinking what? <laughs> Cause, right. So now you're non, you're, you're, so what, right. So what would your, your binary be? Like you're, you're all, I, I'm math. Well, I don't know. Gendered. I'm fucking, it's, it's silly. Yeah. Instead of just saying, no, no, I'm a, I'm a, I am a woman. I express, I'm whatever. Okay. So, but it is, it's not as feminine. It's actually anti-feminist to, to give these attributes to men or to something other than being female and okay. Chest feeding. What do you fucking think about chest feeding? <laughs> I, I talked it's about setting. Yeah. When they call, they refer to us as bleeders, people who bleed, uterus havers. God, I feel like you're in my fucking, this is all the stuff I curate <laughs> privately. And then I, I put on this show and I'm like, oh, peep, not, no, no, it was the tampon thing. Not all people who bleed are women. That was my favorite one. Is that scientifically <laughs> accurate, Dr. So? <laughs> How is that even fucking I, possible? But okay. <laughs> I've been with the same man for a million years. And you know how we keep it fresh? AdamandEve.com. I buy all kinds of sassy stuff and it comes discreetly in a box. So nobody knows what you're buying. Because I know you're like the neighbors, the kids. People will know that I'm a sexual goddess in my own house. But guess what? You're going to get free stuff now. Free stuff to spice up your bedroom 
is the best thing ever. Select almost any one item from adamandeve.com and you get 50% off. Then Adam and Eve loads on the free stuff. Enter offer code WMMA at checkout and get 10, 10 tantalizing free gifts. A sexy item for him, a special gift for her, and a third item, okay, that you'll both enjoy. And six free spicy movies plus Free shipping. It doesn't get any better. Spice up your love life, homies. That's WMMA, WMMA, offer code WMMA at checkout at adamandeve.com. Acne, we've all had it at some point in our lives and getting the treatment for it. I wish I would have known that putting toothpaste on acne doesn't do a damn thing. I wish I would have had apostrophe. Apostrophe is a prescription skincare company that offers science-backed oral and topical medications that are clinically proven to help clear acne. Apostrophe connects you with a board-certified dermatologist who will create a personalized treatment plan that is perfectly tailored to your unique skin. It is so easy. You simply go to their website, you take a little quiz, you upload some pictures and a doctor comes up with a a treatment plan. Um, And then they send you, they send you the meds right to your door. Do you know that we have a special deal for my audience? Save $15 off your first visit with a board certified dermatologist at apostrophe.com slash WMMA. When you use my code WMMA, this code is only available to my listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash WMMA and click begin visit. Then use my code WMMA at sign up and you'll get $15 off your dermatology visit. That's A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash WMMA and use that code WMMA to get your dermatology visit and save $15 and we thank apostrophe for sponsoring the podcast i i think it's okay to want to be sensitive with language i think that's a good thing yes but why is it that you only see this with female female gendered physiology right you don't Mm. see this about male physiology no one has an issue with male prostates and male sperm Ooh, what do you mean let's talk about that (laughs) What do you mean? So if you're saying something like uh, women give birth or mothers, mother is another word that you're not supposed to use, right? Oh, is that, um, I didn't hear that. Wait a minute. What, that got canceled? What is it now? Person who... Birthing, birthing parent, I think. Or prime, maybe primary or secondary parent, depending. Yeah. Admit, yeah. Which I get because trans women yep. don't give birth. And there are some people who would give birth who don't identify as female. Okay, but... Why is it forbidden for the rest of the world to use those terms if they want to? I don't think that's necessary. And I don't think most trans women really have an issue with that. I think it's, again, the activists, this very small proportion of people who are very, very vocal. This is what I think you're dialing into. Because I, look, chest feeding, fine. Is, it, is, is chest feeding scientifically accurate? Let's, mm. let's start the discussion there. Is that... Like logically, because I listen, I'm a logic brained, so I go, is mm. chest feeding? Chest, wait a minute, by, uh, by definition, you must have breasts to produce the milk. So is chest feeding, how is that even logically possible? Well, I like, think it's what, just an avoidance of using the word breast, because for someone who it does not identify as female, they don't want the emphasis to be on that part of their body. So chest gotcha. is more of like a gender neutral thing but you would need to because if you remove your breasts you may not be able to produce milk and feed a child so okay so then so then so i understand there should be a term to to be sensitive to those with those concerns but i think what you just said there was interesting of like but do we then change the term to blanket all people who breastfeed you know what i mean like now do i have to call it and my friends are they chest feeding like, well, that doesn't apply to me. If 1% of the population is such a way, you, you know? Yeah. And this is, I do see a backlash coming, unfortunately. And I think that backlash may, and hopefully it won't affect everyday trans people. Because at I some point, not, yeah. the average, like the population is going to say, we've had enough of this. We, what, is, what is this, right? The, the activists are asking for too much. And now they're, they're going to start to say, well, we're not okay with this. And... I am concerned about that because I don't think everyday trans people should pay the price for what these really aggressive, vocal minority people are saying. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Cause I, I have sympathy for anybody who is like, Oh God, I can't even imagine what that is like, you know? Um, but getting back to children, 
because this is a parenting podcast. So like, mm-hmm. <sighs> people are transitioning their children. Is that is this what's happening now? Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the laws are even in favor of this now. So for in terms of clinicians, they can't do anything. They have to affirm a child with gender dysphoria because there are conversion therapy bans in 20 states in the U.S. In Canada, we are about to criminalize any therapeutic interventions that are not early or affirmative. Wait, we're, so, what do you mean? What, what does that mean? So I, I should also clarify with conversion therapy. So I am not in favor of conversion therapy for sexual orientation because that does not work. So attempts to change sexual orientation, so to make someone who's gay or bisexual, to turn them straight, yeah. that doesn't work. It's not ethical. But what the activists have done is they've conflated attempts to change sexual orientation with therapy that tries to understand a child's gender. And they also call that conversion therapy, even though gender identity is not the same thing as sexual orientation, because children, their gender identity can change over time because they're young, they're still developing. And as I mentioned, with the research showing that most kids with gender dysphoria are going to grow to be comfortable in their Mm -hmm. bodies. So activists have, have lumped in gender identity into these conversion therapy laws. So now clinicians cannot do a proper assessment. So if a child comes into them, and this child says that they have, they have gender dysphoria, if they want to transition, they have to essentially take it at face value. They can't question it. Which, which okay, so which leads to a concerning thing, like how do, what's the criterion upon which we allow the right cases to convert, right? Like there, like what, is there, is there a criterion besides face value at this point? Well, in an ideal situation, before this became so politicized, a good clinician would monitor that child over time Mm -hmm. and see how do they feel as they get closer to puberty, how are they feeling in terms of their their peers, and are they once they start dating and things like that, developing crushes, because a lot of these kids, once from the research perspective, once they start to develop crushes and date, they grow more comfortable in their bodies and they actually like the bodies that they have. Um, but now you you can't you can't even suggest that you can't even say that gender. I mean, in the book, I go through nine different myths and there's another myth that sex, sexual orientation has nothing to do with gender identity. So you can't even talk about romantic interest or anything like that, because if these kids are, are going to be healthy gay adults, I think a more useful conversation is to say it's OK if you're attracted to people who share the same sex as you. That's perfectly fine. Right. Instead of because kids then interpret that as a sign that they're supposed to be the opposite sex. So if you have a little boy who's attracted to other boys, he thinks, well, maybe I'm actually supposed to be a girl because I like boys. And so now in Canada, if a kid goes to the doctor and says, I, I am attracted to other boys and I think I'm a, a girl, the doctor is allowed or now just goes like, here's the medicine. We're going to, here's estrogen. We're transitioning you. It depends on the age. Um, so yeah, the, a clinician can face, once this bill gets passed, which I, I don't see it not being passed because even conservative politicians are backing it, um, a clinician can face up to five years in prison if they, if they don't go along with it. So um, mm. yeah, it's, it's pretty scary. And I think too, as a, uh, there was this great viral meme being passed around Instagram today of this teacher <laughs> it's like and we can't even teach our kids basic grammar and now they're being taught they them as pronouns mm-hmm. like like it's not even <laughs> grammatically correct i can't even teach this and he and i think too the concern is is like is there is this too young to be teaching this stuff to small children like to at least in california now we're, we're teaching this gender identity stuff pretty early from what i'm hearing like in the kindergartens is is that a is that a great idea no <laughs> actually before i before i forget i yeah. want to go back to your point about um kids because what people will say is these kids are just transitioning socially for now even if they don't have medical interventions like some of them will just live as the opposite sex they'll take on new pronouns okay um and a new name but that is actually associated with going on to medical interventions. It's not like these kids change their mind at any point because if you think of kids, if they're getting so much praise and attention for identifying yes. as this new exotic thing, 
why are they going to turn away from that? And especially for, for some of these kids as they get older, if their support is predominantly around their identity, in many cases, they'll lose all of that support if they decide to go back to living as the, their original sex. So I think people really underestimate how difficult it is for kids once they start to go down this path. It's not like they change their mind at any time and it's a, it's a really easy thing for them. Um, because people often say, oh, it's not like these kids are taking hormones or it's not like they're getting surgery at this age, but people don't realize that it's one thing is related to another. But then in terms of the education, I think it's completely inappropriate. A lot of the education I see in terms of gender, um, what's being pushed on these kids is not factually accurate. They have all kinds of nonsensical ideas, like, like you mentioned with gender fluidity or gender being a social construct or wow. some of the gender to traditional gender norms um, or that there are, are hundreds or even billions of genders. <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's so. Um, but here's the thing, like, you know, you you I read Simone de Beauvoir I was a good feminist in college, and she believed that f uh, gender is a social construct. There is some of that. <sighs> I'm so confused. So, you know, like, <laughs> how well, much, it, you know, there are cultural influences because people who get mad at, at those of us who say gender is not a social construct, they'll say, well, it's not like, it's not like, um, they'll say that we only care about biology and that's not true. I would say that culture plays an influence in terms of determining what is masculine or feminine. Uh -huh. so, but whether you gravitate towards what's masculine or feminine, regardless of whether you're male or female is determined by uh, hormonal exposure in utero right i've heard of this <laughs> right whether, whether you have testosterone washing over you as as an embryo or whatever as a developing fetus right like like you and i were i consider us to be masculine females right what did you call yeah. us male typical so do we just have more <laughs> testosterone washing over us in utero probably i mean there are studies to show that girls who are more male typical were exposed to higher levels of testosterone in the womb and this mm. is even in the case if they're of their parents giving them more praise so when kids come out Ooh. when they're born then they gravitate Nailed toward it. particular toys even if the parents give them more praise so these girls who are exposed to higher levels of testosterone will prefer boys toys like trucks mm. even if their parents try to encourage them to play with dolls so it's, it's really interesting to hear stories of parents who are super on board this um, gender and being a social construct train because if their girls play with dolls, they're absolutely horrified. They try to basically <laughs> eradicate yeah. anything that's feminine yeah. from the house. Yeah. And then the daughters go to school and yeah. then they come home and say they want a doll and they think, oh my God, I, what am I supposed to do now? And it's just, I say just let your kid play with a doll. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I thought I I bought into this stuff a little bit before I had kids. Let me tell you, you cannot affect that shit. Like my little boys are savage boys. It is <laughs> trucks and dirt and throwing stuff like no amount. And I did with with my older boy. I was like, here's a doll. And he was like, that's cool. Just threw it down. Like there's you, you can't dude. there. You, you can try, but you can't. So. Here's one thing I, I was trying to understand in your book. How does, how does biology affect your gender expression? How does the biological stuff affect your gender expression? So if you are, um, let me, what's the best example? Say if you are female and you are um, exposed to higher levels of testosterone, gravitate toward more male typical things, things that boys are interested in, the way you express yourself, you're probably going to be more masculine as well. So say in terms of the clothing you wear, how you wear your hair, maybe you'll shave your head or cut it short, um, you know, be punk, yeah. wear yeah. Doc that Martens. Did that. Yeah. Yeah. Badass like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so or conversely, if it's, a, if it's a boy, say, exposed to lower levels of testosterone, he might be more feminine. More feminine. So it is, it's a hormonal thing, how we gender express ourselves. But that, that is the tabooness of, right? That's the crux of all of this, why it's so taboo right now to say that it's well, science. It's, well, they don't want to say it's biology at all. They want to say that everything is totally 
socially constructed or that everything is completely due to um, cultural influence or parents or the media. Right. And the reward of doing that, right. And I understand the intent because if you remove biology from, let's say how a woman is or how a man is, I think the theory was to free us from those boundaries and limitations Right. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I can I can do anything like, yeah, but but you're still you are still tethered to your biology and it's not always a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily I don't think we have to deny biology to promote people being able to free be free to do whatever they want. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know why we ever have to. I think it just becomes an easier argument to make if people just deny the reality of that, because there are people who will latch on to these studies and say, because biology dictates whatever, this is a justification to say mm. that women are inferior or women are not as capable at doing whatever that it is that men do, which I obviously don't agree with. But I think it comes down to in a lot of cases, people just they don't know anything about the research. And I don't know, don't blame people. I mean, I probably wouldn't either if, if this was not my job. But I, I don't think it's fair or right that what you see happening now in the discourse is that people who have actually no idea about any of this, these studies are being given a, a platform or in some cases being allowed to speak over legitimate scientists. Because you'll see, like in terms of the news coverage, they'll say that pre prenatal testosterone is a myth. And I'm thinking, how can you deny? These are thousands of studies showing that the, this there are effects there. You can't just say it doesn't exist. It's not magical thinking. But that's what we see happening now. And that is because, so, so this, these studies that do promote this way of thinking are what's going on there. These are scientists who are drinking the, the Kool-Aid or they're afraid to be shunned. What, what is going on? <laughs> I think both. I think for some of them, they think this is going to bring about positive social change. I think it's a little bit of a joke if they think that denying science is, is in any way good for society. I think it's actually pretty patronizing to say that they, they feel that they have to contort facts to bring about what's good for society. Why not let people in society figure that out for themselves, right? Mm. I, I don't think it's their place to hide information from people and lie about what the truth is to bring about whatever the ut utopia that they have in mind is. Mm. But I think also a lot of scientists are afraid, and especially for men and white men Oof. they they really can't say anything about any of this nowadays like my colleagues who are world experts can they you can sense there's there's reluctance on their part to criticize any of this because they get dismissed as being sexist and racist which yeah. has nothing to do with it i know god forbid i know oh my god <laughs> That's um, even I remember was it was it no there was some guy who produced uh you probably know who this is the scientific study about how women gravitate towards social fields as opposed to scientific fields did you hear this I think Jordan Peterson picked it up and then it got the guy got fired and he he was just kind of socially was this in your book even? Oh, I might, yeah, James Damore, yeah, because I defended him. <laughs> I wrote a column that defended him. It was for the Globe and Mail. This was in 2017. And people went berserk over that because he, he's, he was an engineer at the time um, for Google, and they, they had asked for employee feedback. This is all in Chapter 2 of my book, so yeah. I, won't, I won't go too much into it. But basically, I defended him, and I said that this memo he wrote was scientifically accurate, that on average women and men gravitate toward different occupations and the average woman does not find something like coding as interesting <laughs> as a per people focused occupation, but people didn't, didn't like that. But um, that's not I, to say that there aren't women who do code. There are exactly. women who do these things. It's just that as a majority the statistical data shows, right, that women tend to gravitate towards the social industries, social mm -hmm. works talking to people versus sitting in a dark room. <laughs> I think you yeah, said that. by yourself, <laughs> staring at a screen, crying. Because <laughs> didn't you code but, for a while too? Didn't you I, do it for a while, you said? Yeah, for my PhD, I coded. And I, anyone who wants to pretend that coding is fun and glamorous has never coded. I can tell you that much. The way they were talking about it at the time was that that this is the best job in the world. I mean, some people are very good at it. They're yeah. very good at it. And it's an important job. But I would say 
most women on average prefer to be around people. When you're coding, you don't get to talk to people. You're just literally yeah. typing at your computer. Unless you're in that Facebook movie at Zuckerberg's house. I don't know if you remember that summer he rents out a house and they're all like getting hammered and he's plugged in right now. And then that guy's coding and then they do cannonballs in the pool. So it wasn't like that for you? <laughs> no, I was missing out apparently. Yeah. <laughs> But Man. the other thing with that memo is the way it was presented again in the news yes. is that that James had said that women are less competent. <laughs> he never said that. I've never said that. I don't believe that. But it's the way they skew it, because I think if you have a point, why do you need to lie about what the facts are? That's what I find very questionable. Yeah, it was a factual study. I remember when it came out and there was such controversy over that study and again huge feminist and i was like yeah but he's not saying that women can't do x or y or z he's just saying that they tend not to gravitate towards those fields it's not like women women are fucking stupid it's not that <laughs> he was just like they're not whatever they're not doing it man man so this stuff it's if i feel wild it feels wild that i'm even having to have this conversation uh with you like <laughs> over what seems to me just like those are it's evidence facts. So let's talk about um, the trend. <laughs> um, there is a man in the United States, I forget which state, that he had his gender changed to X on his driver's license. <sighs> I'm all for subjective expression. And then, then you start to go, well, what's that going to lead to down the road? Like where we declare our genders like there has to be some logical implication down the road that this is this is not going to be good for society i don't know yeah because i think um in certain states you can you can get an x designation without even needing a note from your doctor so wow i i think it's in a lot of these cases the individual context doesn't seem like such an issue. Like, okay, so you can go and get a piece of paper with an X on it. All right, sure. But what does this mean in terms of self-identification more broadly? So that means that anyone can identify as anything and that that's going to be legally recognized, which is essentially where we are already and we're continuing to go in that direction in that you will see individuals who are born male. So say, um, I, I guess one extreme version of that is prison where prison now depending on where you are is based on self-identification so if there's a convicted sex offender who identifies so someone who is convicted as a sex offender was male at the time of their offenses identifies as female is going to be put into a female prison so people might say okay going from a piece of paper to that is that not a far leap but it's i don't think it it's, is i don't because people can see that the sex offenders will see that they can exploit this people who are antisocial I, mean, I used to work clinically with sex offenders anyone who wants to try and manipulate the system to for their means is going to do that and people are afraid to push back against that that's what's troubling is people are afraid to push back on that Father's Day is coming and it is swimsuit season. And I know my husband needs a lot of help downstairs with the grooming because it is a feral wild bush, which is why we love Manscaped, Manscaped Lawn Mower 4.0 and the refined cologne by Manscaped. I love this cologne, by the way. He wears it now and I just, it's so fresh. The brand new Lawn Mower 4.0 and refined cologne is perfect for your man or your dad to complete their grooming game. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WMMA at manscaped.com. Manscaped is already trusted by 2 million men. Make sure they are one of them. Why not hook up your mom? Why not hook up your mom? Don't you think your mom is sick and tired of looking at your dad's nasty, overgrown bush? I guarantee it. I guarantee those boomers uh, don't don't manscape. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WMMA at manscaped.com. His balls will thank you. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code WMMA. Get him feeling and smelling amazing this year with Manscaped. OMG, if you were around in the 90s, you remember Hooked on Phonics commercials. Come on, who doesn't love that? It's a brand we grew up with or maybe even used 
to learn how to read. Is there anything more iconic than Hooked on Phonics? Worked for me. 35 years later, Hooked on Phonics is still the leader in teaching children to read. And something I mentioned to all the parents I know who are interested in supporting their child's path to becoming a reader. We are hooked on phonics in the Segura household. It's such a great learn to read curriculum. It combines an amazing app with hands-on learning materials shipped to your home every month. We're huge readers at our house, so we're such fans. You get unlimited access to their powerful reading app along with the workbooks that give your child's essential hands-on practice to reinforce the skills they're building in the app. Give your child the confidence that reading brings with Hooked on Phonics. Visit hookedonphonics.com slash WMMA and receive your first month for just $1. That's hooked on P-H-O-N-I-C-S dot com slash WMMA to get your first month of Hooked on Phonics for just $1. Hookedonphonics.com slash WMMA. And also when you see in athletics, um, I mean, Joe Toss talked about it, I think he talked about it with you. Like, is it is it even a, a great idea to have um, someone who was once a man transition to become a woman now fighting another woman? Like, that's fucking dangerous, bro. Like, that's mm -hmm. not, is that even, is that a good idea? <laughs> is that safe? <laughs> like, Wait, you know, that's, that's fucking dangerous. Because people can die. I mean, I think yeah. if there's some way, this, I mean, I have to say too, I love, I love Joe Rogan. I mean, he's been so supportive and he's dealt with a lot after having me on his show twice now. So I'm grateful to him for just not backing down. But this issue in particular, I mean, the public is being told that there, are, I just saw recently, actually, there, there was a, a news story saying the reason that people say there are biologically based differences between men and women in sport and that's why it's unfair for trans women to compete in women's sports is due to patriarchy and the sexist belief that men are stronger than women hold on i'm trying to wrap my head around the argument okay walk me through it again okay okay so people like me i guess who criticize this idea that trans women should be competing in women's sports we are operating apparently from this misguided belief, Patriot. this sexist belief right. that men are stronger than women. Wait, is it, is it misguided? Wait. No. <laughs> <laughs> Cause but that's the thing. It takes a second, right? Like, yeah. What? what are you saying? Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I think if I get it, sport is about community. It's about belonging and just having fun in some cases. But if, it's at the competitive or elite level, it's not appropriate. Because again, what you see in some cases is people are, are allowed based on self-identification. In some cases, they have guidelines. Like I believe with fighting, they require them to. So for someone born male um, who wants to compete in the female category, she will have had to have had her testes removed and be on cross-sex hormones for two years. I think that's the, gui the, the guidelines. But it's still questionable, does that override physical differences or a physical advantage right the the musculature as george takei says musculature of a male <laughs> physique right i mean the muscles alone um i'm pretty sure if i took my husband's testicles off <laughs> <laughs> like um and you know even gave him estrogen like he could still fucking kill me he could still kill me like he's just bigger than me and taller and you know He's a fucking gorilla. Like he could kill me. Well, I mean, you just watch these competitions and you see, I mean, it's very difficult to turn away and pretend you're not seeing what you're seeing when they're competing against these girls. It's not fair. No, but again, it's considered, you know, whatever anti trans rights, I, I guess is what I would be if I was like, Hey, I don't know if this is a good idea. Is this safe? <laughs> like, but most most trans women are not on board with this. They're saying, please oh, do wow. not say that we want trans women to be competing against in the women's divisions of sports. Like they're not at, they're not even asking for that. So you're, <laughs> this is the best part. So the trans, you're telling me, let's reiterate, the trans community is not being like, we need this to happen, Karens of the world. We want the Karens <laughs> to unite and, and get this done. So no one's, at, no one's asking for this shit in that community. Well, I don't. 
I don't want to speak for them, of course, right. and I don't want to say that this is everybody in the community, but the sense I get from the number of trans women who reach out to me telling me this is that, or, or they at least think it's unfair and that there should be something in place to make it more fair. But my sense is oh, most are not asking for this. They just want to have the right to transition and be left alone and be respected. And I am totally on board with that. Totally on board with love, support, compassion. Of course. Of course. What is it somebody brought up? This just reminds me of um, what we were talking about earlier. Oh, well, it reminds me of Caitlyn Jenner. Like when she transitioned, it was like, hallelujah, like you're a lady now. And everyone <laughs> should be, how do I put this? Like, I don't, why do I feel like, oh, that's all it takes to be a lady? Like you, you're part of this club now and it and she became like woman of the year and stuff it didn't it it's like fuck you like you're not really maybe i'll cut this part out of my podcast <laughs> what i'm trying to say here well i know what you mean because there are i think some women find it very offensive that not necessarily caitlin but that any person that was born male and now identifies as female who transitions that this is um, what it means to be a woman. And in some cases, yes. because these individuals embody a very stereotypical idea of what it means to be a woman with like long hair, lots of makeup, fake nails. And I say, if, if you want to... That's right, Dr. Deborah. So that's what I'm trying to put my finger on. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like, no, you meet the patriarchal, like she's a hot chick now and we mm. like hot chicks. So she's, you know, it's like... <laughs> Well, is that what that means to be a trans woman too? Like, ah, uh, but go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. I got so excited. Well, no, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I think if women do want to, then power to yeah. you. But I understand why some people find that offensive because they say, well, that's not being a woman. Also, comes with all this other stuff that someone born male did not have to experience. But the other part of this is that there are. So I have a chapter in the book that talks about autogynephilia. So that is a paraphilia. <laughs> you, you know where this is going. So <laughs> it's a paraphilia, which is an unusual sexual yeah. interest. And this was my research expertise, actually, one of my areas of expertise. And so for autogynephilia translates from Greek to love of oneself as a woman. And so for some individuals who are born male who transition to female, they, they're motivated by the fact that having a female body is sexually arousing to them. Mm. So this is another area of research that you're not supposed to talk about. People say it's pseudoscience or that it's been debunked. That's not true. It's legitimate research. Anyone who works with patients with gender dysphoria knows this is legitimate, but you can't say it because there are some people who really dislike it because it has sexual arousal as a motivator for transitioning and and pe I think many activists would prefer to downplay anything that has to do with sex to try and um, make it more socially palatable or make the activism more socially palatable. But I, I always want to emphasize, I do think someone with autogynephilia similarly deserves no judgment, love, you know, support. Doesn't mean that they shouldn't transition. I do think some people, my, my colleagues who are clinicians will say some people with autogynephilia can benefit from transitioning. So I don't think that's a reason to rule them out. And I also don't think it should be used to justify negative stereotypes about trans people or trans women. But I do think it's actually quite harmful to pretend that this doesn't exist because since the end of gender has come out, I've had so many people reach out to me saying that this is them or it's helped them understand themselves or someone in their life who has autogynephilia. And they're really grateful mm -hmm. for that because they could not have found this information anywhere else. And that that's what's important to me is give people the information and give them options to decide because right now people are being told if you in any way feel say if you're born male and you feel in any way feminine that means you should transition and that's the only thing that's going to make you happy yeah that's i think that's what's concerning to other parents that i speak with about this of course behind closed doors very hush hush you know like it's the secret society of moms who are like i'm not so mm -hmm. sure i'm down with this stuff um <laughs> you know it's like uh it is it's dangerous i think to encourage like if one of my boys came to me and was like mom i think i'm a girl 
I'd be like, cool. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's maybe tippy toe into this. Like here's a, here's a dress. Let's try that on for a few years. Mm-hmm. But like as, in terms of hormonal therapy and going down that road, I, I as a parent, I'd have to be like, okay, hey, let's wait until 18. Can we wait? And if you're still, you know, really into this, then, then yeah, do transition. But is that, what's the problem with, with waiting until 18? Well, I guess because it is time sensitive. So if a child oh, undergoes right. puberty and then they realize that transition would have been better for them, then it's going to be more difficult for them to yes. live as the opposite sex. But I would also just in the same vein with autogynephilia, what you're seeing now is that adolescent boys. So when this, when pe- children, I don't want to say children, when adolescents start to become sexually interested or when, once they've gone through puberty, And that awakens in them. So for people with autogynephilia, that's usually when it starts to happen. So now Mm. they're immediately being told that they are actually trans women when in some cases this is just essentially it's a kink. It's a sexual kink. Do you think some of this stuff, this hysteria um, is is kind of it is is it related to just an American puritanical view of sex in general is is we're so afraid of our genitals. It, I mean, <laughs> it could be, but I, cause I think the, the sense I guess the activists are predominantly extreme left, but maybe because they're, they know that if they downplay the sexual aspect, they're going to have an easier time winning people over. That's probably where it's coming from. Okay. In sense. I have a question for you. You mm-hmm. just to explain to people listening and they're like, but Dr. So, okay, you're telling me that there's only two genders, but what about those outliers? What about these, there's like communities of people, right? You mentioned, I think in India called the, I don't even remember what they're called. Like these. Oh, yeah, yeah, the hijra. Right, like what about these people, these outliers? So let's discuss that. What about people that might have ambiguous genitalia? Is that what you would call it? Or right, yes. mixed? Intersex, yeah. Intersex, yes. So. I have, I think this chapter three, when I talk about those um, examples, what I love is a lot of people will say that my book does not cover certain things or does not cover certain criticisms when it does. So that I have a chapter devoted to that because people always, they will tokenize the intersex community and say, these people show that sex is a spectrum because intersex, this is a condition where someone is born with both male and female anatomy, um, reproductive anatomy. So... Most intersex people, however, prefer to live as either male or female. They don't want Mm -hmm. sex to be collapsed into a spectrum and they they don't want to be considered as somewhere along in between male and female. So I think we can advocate again for equal rights for intersex people and especially to give children bodily autonomy because what you would see historically is doctors would impose their ideas of what a child should look like on the child and then do these surgeries that Mm. a child cannot consent to. So I think we can say, well, don't do that. But at the same time, sex is binary. Um, And also intersex people are as many as 1% of the population. That's still a very small percentage of the population. And then it becomes a question of, should we reconceptualize anything in life based on a very small population i mean it's, it doesn't even have to be about intersex people it could be anything like an, an example i give in the book is some people have fewer than 10 fingers are we going to reconceptualize how many fingers people typically have <laughs> right. it doesn't make sense well that is interesting yeah sorry go ahead i was just going to say that it's just a, it's a wider ideology i see of of people who just want to reconceptualize everything in our society for the mm. sake of doing that yeah i agree because when you when you say that in your book, you you do bring up the the intersex when a doctor would say, okay, this child is born with both genitalia. I'm going to choose for that person. I'm going to construct a vagina. I'm going to construct a penis. And then that poor person grows up and they're like, dude, I don't want to be a man. I don't want this penis. Like that is horrible. And like, that's so sad that that happens. Mm-hmm. But I think, didn't you say statistically, factually that doctors like 99% of the time correctly identify people's yeah. sex? Because now they've changed the nomenclature to say, instead of saying biological sex or birth sex, they say sex assigned at birth, which is not accurate because sex is not assigned at birth. Sex is what it is. But they've worded this to make it sound as though the doctor's arbitrarily deciding 
at, at, at birth what sex a baby is. But again, like you said, 99% of the time, the doctor is going to be right because the intersex is such a small percentage of the wow. population. But parents are, I think some parents think that it's much more common. And so this, that's why this language makes sense. But it's, again, it's purely ideological because they're, they want to come at it from this perspective of nothing is real. Nothing can yes. really be determined yeah. Yes, it's anti-scientific and anti-logic and reason. And and it, mm-hmm. I guess it come. Does it come from? I'm trying to piece all this stuff together. Is this from this idea of the include the inclusivity stuff? Like everybody's inclusive. We're all inclusive. And I think you and I are like absolutely, dude. Like join the party. Yes, let's do that. Um, and I think the rejection of white male European concepts of (laughs) of like you know x and y and determining stuff and the majority if it's something doesn't function in a majority fashion like in that that philosophy i forget fucking my brain is fried because i've been living with my kids in a hotel room for a few days but um Mm -hmm. pragmatism right american like if something makes sense if, if it serves the majority of the population let's do that but that whole way of thinking has been identified as white, male, patriarchal, bad, bad, logic, reason, science thinking is male. Mm-hmm. It's patriarchal. It's bad. It's colonial, colonialism yeah. at its finest. Fuck that. Now we're going to go here. We're going to create this new frontier where everybody's included, everybody, but to the expense of the majority. Is, that, is, this, is this what's happening, big picture? So, so that's why you'll see like as identified at birth. Well, you're like, no, dude, if 99 out of 100 times it's done traditionally correctly, why are we catering to the minority? Yeah, that's that's what I see it as. It's part of the same push in that. And I think when the day comes, if the day comes where everything is exactly as they currently want it to be, they're going to push even further from there. It's, it, there's never going to be a point where there's an equilibrium. But as you said, it's, it's also mm. just the... the the anti-science, anti-reason aspect, they treat science as though it's completely arbitrary and that subjective experience is more important or your own so-called personal truth is more important. It's really worrisome because I didn't ever think that I would see this happening. It's taken over academia. I have a chapter in the book dedicated to this about cancel culture and academia. It's taken over the hard sciences. And so the point to the point now where when studies come out, I mean, the most common question I've been asked the last couple shows I've done is how do we even know when science is real now? Because you know that it's been compromised and that there is ideology in it there. Mm. And uh, it's it's really difficult, I think, for for people to trust that anything that's being produced and that claims to be empirical or based on evidence is actually that way. But then your point about third gender societies or cultures those individuals, if they were being viewed in a Western context, they would be gay people. Mm. So, Hold on. Mm-hmm. They would just be gay people or would they be trans, gay? Sorry, what category? Are we non-binary? Are we? Um, so if, they, if you have, say, an example would be uh, the Fafafine in Samoa. So these are people who are born male, but they're more stereotypically feminine and they're considered a third gender. Mm-hmm. But they... If they were in, say, North America, they'd be considered gay men. And in Fafafine they're con- they're, or in Samoa, they're considered a third gender. They're not trans women. They will say, we are not women. We are in between. So you'll see sometimes people will point to them and say, these are trans people or these are, this is sign that gender is a spectrum. But again, it's, it's just that, that these activists want to jump on anything they can to justify whatever social change they want to push. Yes, it's a, it's a whole agenda, man. And then, so what is the fa fine scientifically? What what do we what is that? Then what do we call them? Uh, they are born male, but probably less masculinized in the womb, which is why they're more feminine. So they're just like feminine. gay men, and, yeah, Fe- feminine men. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah man it's it's a uh, and like I, I again i went to school in san francisco for undergrad and like i i grew i was just lucky to be in sf during like the gay heyday man like mm-hmm. it was there was trans dudes there was a dude wearing pedal pushers at my school and like you know what i mean it was like it was just 
it was so cool and it was so free. And so, and now I feel like this constant labeling and putting people into category, like I'm a this and I'm a that, I'm a that, 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 the, that, 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 that. It tends to, I, I feel more divided than ever. This constant labeling it's, and labeling and eh, da, 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 da. And it's so authoritarian too, which ah. I, you know, prior to that, it's very, I'm very much le, live and let live type of person. And I think do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anybody. Yeah. But it, now, it's to, now it's to the point where it's like, you have to do this. And we're not, it's not just about mutual respect. It's about, okay, now we're going to go and put this into law. So you have to do it. And if you don't, we're going to try and ruin you and call you all these names and smear you. And it's, it's completely, I mean... <sighs> It's unnecessary. And what it's, I think is it's very, very extreme people who have just latched yes. on to this movement as a way to express their own pathology in uh, some cases. Pathology. Exactly. Mm. True. Well, we were just talking about Demi Lovato's pathology and uh, the Froyo. I don't know if you heard about the Froyo restaurant that she was uh, triggered by the Froyo shop because they don't respect her dietary needs. Do better. Cancel the Froyo shop. It, a lot of times it is a pathology thing but it started in the universities no like is because I, I remember as a philosophy major i was i graduated in 99 and i remember i learned traditional western philosophy and then at the very end we learned postmodernism. and so i i remember the teachers being like all right there's this wacky shit out there <laughs> it's called postmodernism. it doesn't make any fucking sense it's not logically coherent but here it is and i remember hearing that this is the beginning of the critical race theory this is the all, all this stuff that we're hearing, like marginalized, like dairy, da, 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 all this stuff. And now I, I had my head down for 20 years, living my life. I put my head up and I'm like, oh, this has become like mainstream thought. And the universities are pushing this shit. And now the kindergartens, it's even started in kindergarten. Um, all this, these, we, this, it's like the upside down. It's just being mm -hmm. perpetuated and perpetuated. Yeah, the, they were smart to do that. So go ahead. Yeah, no, no, tell me. They're smart to do that. Now it's infecting the science community. And once you kill the scientists, remember we mentioned Galileo at the beginning. <laughs> like, that's it. Your society's fakakta. Yeah, because what you have now is all of the, the kids who are indoctrinated in university, they go out into the world and they get jobs and they get promoted in their jobs. So now this is why this is so widespread. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in you see this ideology there and i would say even a couple of years ago it was not this bad and, and people would say to me because i would be writing about this they would say this is just this very fringe problem that you have in academia this is never going to affect people in the real world so we don't have to be worried but now there's no question i mean you if you don't see it in your workplace it's because you are willfully turning away from it i think i don't think it's possible for people not to see this coming in and infringing on their ability to do their job or just live as human beings Yes. And again, I'm, I'm all open to these ideas in some regard, like, oh, that's, that's really thought provoking, or I never thought of that. I, wow, like, yeah, l enlighten me. But then when it's becoming a mandate that you must speak the new speak, you must, do, you have to do this this way, then it's like, yo, is this America, bro? Like, I thought we were still allowed <laughs> to have different ideas and I can respect you. You respect me. Like, dude, this is funky. Like, I'm, I'm not about that life. This episode is sponsored by Monk Pack, who makes snacks that taste like our favorite sugary treats with just one gram of sugar or less. We have the Monk Pack Keto Granola Bars. They have just one gram of sugar, two to three grams of net carbs, and they're only 140 calories, which is so great if you're not trying to blow that diet. They're gluten-free, grain-free, plant-based, and non-GMO with no soy, trans fat, sugar, alcohols, or artificial colors. And best of all, they taste great. They're delicious. They have a soft and chewy texture and come in delicious flavors like coconut, cocoa, chip, peanut butter, and blueberry almond vanilla. That one's my fave. Try it for yourself and you'll see. And we have a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting monkpack.com and enter code WMMA at checkout. And Monk Pack is so confident in their product. It's backed with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll exchange the product or refund your money whichever you prefer. To get started, just go to monkpack.com. That's M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K.com and select any product, then enter code WMMA at checkout to save 20% off your purchase. Monk Pack, delicious, nutritious food you can count on. We thank them for sponsoring the podcast. 
I love shopping online. It's something I'm really good at. (laughs) And we've all seen that promo code field taunt us at checkout. If only I had the promo code. Well, now you do with Honey. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. And when you go to check out, the Honey button drops down. And all you have to do is click apply coupons. You wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. And if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. Fantastic. I saved $15 on um, a pair of sneakers. I love Honey for just that reason. It's so much easy. It's so easy. Over 17 million members and over $2 billion in savings. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and it installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself solid and supporting this podcast. I never recommend something I don't use myself. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash WMMA. That's joinhoney.com slash WMMA. You're a sex scientist. Before we let you go, I, I really appreciate you giving me your time. Like, it's just such a dream. Oh, of course. All my mom friends were all like frothing, just so excited that I was going to talk oh. to you today. And <laughs> so, thank you. thank you to your mom friends too. Girl, it's, I feel like it's an undercurrent. It's like we're this, I'm the secret society of moms <laughs> who are like, dude, are you, do you understand this shit? Like, what is going on? I'm not sure I understand this. Like, I want to understand. I, I want to know. Um, you have a PhD in the neuroscience of sex. Whoa, what's the craziest shit you've heard? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot. Oh, I don't know. <sighs> Let me think of a good one. Okay. I'll start you off. There's Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> There's actually, so paraphilia is my favorite. I've, I've listed a couple of para- my favorite paraphilias. There are people actually, cool raphilia. This is a paraphilia for, for clowns. So people who actually are are sexually attracted to clowns and that's there so if you have a true paraphilia this is your sexual preference so this is what you need in order to be fulfilled sexually wow and i've seen clown porn i had a friend into this (laughs) so but let me ask you so how how do fetishes how do fetishes start how does it come to be that one becomes attracted to clowns or dirty diapers or whatever there is so we need more research to know this definitively but there is likely a biological component so my research was using brain imaging to understand paraphilias and so it's it's it was previously believed that they are learned so through whatever experience in childhood i think it's likely a mix of biology and experience in terms of people who are paraphilic probably have some sort of underlying um, predisposition biologically and then whatever it is that they gravitate toward is determined by early experiences so with paraphilia as i say whatever you're into that's cool so long as it's consensual that's yes. no one's place to judge man i just finished listening to a podcast about an adult baby diaper wear mm. and i'm fat i'm like i love these kinks and stuff you know i just i love it. i'm so vanilla so when i hear so it am I. yeah <laughs> The irony, right? That the yeah. the PhD in sex is like, I don't, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but, I, but to hear this man on this podcast talk about his excitement when he puts on a diaper. I mean, Deborah, it was like, like <laughs> I have never been that excited about anything in my life. And he was like, I put the diapers on and I feel alive inside. So you're telling me there's a biological component that makes one inclined towards paraphilia in the first place, right? Yeah. So there's an, an initial genetic thing. So it's your reptilian wiring that's like, I don't know, dude, there's going to be an object in my future. I don't know what that <laughs> special something is. And then, and then, okay, so then... Is that kind of an, uh, 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 obviously, is that a misfiring for like wanting to reproduce with another person? Like, does that, you know what I mean? Like, does that, that that's counter biology then? Because then you'd be gravitating right. towards an object versus a person when that endanger the human, you know, procreation stuff. Right. That's one thing. Well, that's one reason why I found them so fascinating because it's, I would, I want to understand why is it that people find in some cases, like you said, these inanimate objects or behaviors that don't really make sense from an evolutionary perspective. Why is that the thing that they like? Because that doesn't, it's not going to help them procreate, but something like a ba- uh, adults, baby diaper lovers, there's a, probably a masochistic element too. So it's that humiliation. 
So sexual masochism is being turned on by being humiliated or suffering. So for some people, the idea of, of being infantilized is embarrassing for them. I guess, did, did he talk about whether he liked people caring for it, him? Because mm-hmm. that can be part mm-hmm. of it too, yeah. Mm-hmm. So then he told he talked about the that there are littles, there are people who like to be in little space, like they do age regression play, is the, what the phrase that he used. And then there are adults, like the people who love to take you know be caregivers to Mm -hmm. the littles and like change the diaper and then all consensual obviously they're all adults and they have like rules and guidelines and such um humiliation that's interesting i don't recall him doing that one but i probably the need to be cared for and i don't Mm -hmm. know so so it's cool too when you see if you see their um i guess you would call equipment like the cribs are huge have you seen and the building blocks are huge (laughs) I love it. And and again, like this man's enthusiasm, the love of the game. You're just like, man, if I felt that way about anything in life, like he's so <laughs> lucky that he's like, he knows. So, so like for vanilla folks like us though. So we're just like, Hey, I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about missionary, but is that because, <laughs> <laughs> but like, should I be uncovering a deeper layer or is that just my, like, am I socialized to be not curious? Am I, am I somehow traumatized into not being more curious? No, I don't. Well, paraphilias are predominantly in men. Yeah. That's the other thing. Fucking dudes. So the only pair of, the only paraphilia dudes. you see in women is, is masochism. So. What? So, okay. Masochism is when I hurt myself, right? Yeah, but not all women. It's just of paraphilias, the only one that you tend to see in women is masochism. Um, but I think that's totally fine. If you're happy and you're content, then there's nothing wrong with that. So what are these broads like? These are the ones that are into being hit. You, they, the women, they like to be hit. Is that what you're telling me? They could be into, like BDSM is very common. BDSM is not true masochism or sadism because there's consent involved there and boundaries. Wait, it's not true. But, it's not true. Well, it's not like hardcore, real sadism, masochism, because with BDSM, it's usually more role playing versus masochism, say, or sadism. What's what's sexually arousing is that the person is actually doing these things and causing pain and suffering. So someone who's a sexual sadist, obviously, I don't agree with this because this is not consensual. Yeah, they (laughs) they find it arousing to seriously hurt their partner or cause their partner psychological suffering but in bdsm that's just a role play so you put it you're uh-huh. not really trying to damage your partner so what's going on there when someone genuinely wants to harm their partner i guess it depends it's hard to say without actually talking to a specific person but it can be antisociality. Yeah. it can be um trying to think of the patients i've seen some kind of psychopathy is that yeah it could be that um it can be there's something called coercive paraphilia so these are men who prefer coercive sex to consensual sex but that's a little bit different from sadism but you will see those together it's a pretty scary mix actually um (laughs) when you (laughs) see scary (laughs) but fascinating uplifting topics but yeah i love it I, hey it's my fave i mean let's go to the dark side of the force that's what this is all about <laughs> awesome so so women are more into masochism that's fascinating and men do more of the harming which which makes sense right male serial killers and stuff is this <laughs> yeah well i think too for because i hear often that it's very common for men to have partners who want to be roughed up a bit in bed and then they will say well i don't know if i'm on board with that because i don't want to hurt you mm. and then how do you know if it's really um consensual right because there are also some women like the idea of having non-consensual sex and then the male partner then has to decide is that something he's actually okay with because that's risky yeah oh Especially i have a today's question. climate okay yeah. <laughs> sorry i'm really interested <laughs> tom and i have you ever seen <laughs> that show it was on hbo come on the polyamory polyamorous it was a documentary that followed like five different couples excuse me dr so what is okay polyamory 
that kind of does that go against our biological thing of having children together and sticking together too some people would argue that polyamory is more evolved to have multiple partners what does the data say what does the research say uh i think hmm. so polyamory is when people have romantic relationships with multiple people yes and so you're asking in the context of child rearing is it better for them to or is it going against human nature what's going I think, on let's talk about what's going on there and and is it <laughs> yeah and, and from a from a evolutionary from a biological standpoint like some people will say that polyamory is a more evolved position and that marriage mm -hmm. is you know the man institutional holding us down keeping the patriarchy right keeping the women in line reproducing women or property um I don't know. What's the research? Uh, like, it, do people flourish under these conditions? Is this something that is healthy and doable? I think more research needs to be done because I would say, I say people like I'm monogamous personally when I'm in a relationship, but I, I think people should do what makes them happy. Although I think jealousy is a, a huge issue that many people who go into polyamorous relationships they have to be able to manage the jealousy. And I think some people go into it not realizing because you see this now with young people, especially are told that, like you said, it's enlightened to, to be poly. And I think some people are able to manage it and are able to have healthy relationships. But I think a lot of people really underestimate how um, real that emotion is. And it's been beneficial yeah. to us to have jealousy when our mate at the thought of our mate going and being with other people. But I think also for women who say that it's uh, a patriarchal thing, it's, I would say to be in a monogamous relationship or to have a partner who's committed to you from an evolutionary perspective, it would probably be better for your offspring because you know he's not going to run off with someone else and leave you with your children and you're, you have to raise them and fend for yourself. So this is the same trend of people who are going in and saying, okay, everything needs to be turned upside down sexual orientation is fluid and all this other stuff that's another chapter i have but. yes talk about that real quick i know I'm, i want to keep you here all day because i love you <laughs> gender fluidity sexual fluidity i remember reading that book on uh, the 90s sexual fluidity women are allowed yeah. to be sexually fluid men not so much uh, well i think it's it's also just women are biologically probably more flexible in that way in terms of because studies have shown that women will be aroused by a range of different things even if it's not their primary category of interest so whether a woman is straight or gay she'll be turned on by say if she's looking at pornography of same sex or mixed sex or i like it <laughs> all then, baby <laughs> <laughs> um what was i saying so yeah but with sexual fluidity i think that now it's come to mean this idea that you can have sex, you can be attracted to anybody. There's no such thing as sexual orientation. And then did you see actually there was this trending video about super straights no. and this poor kid got attacked for saying, and I just say, let people be into what they're into and don't, don't be so, I mean, I think it's just as bad when people say, oh, it's wrong to be gay. It's just as bad to say you, you shouldn't be straight. Now it's coming from the opposite direction. Yeah. I think it's, it. I know. And it's so like, taboo to say it but i feel kind of bad for the white guys right now i feel kind of bad for the straight white guys out there you know i i love those straight white guys like mm -hmm. I, I they're my comrades in stand-up comedy mostly <laughs> straight white guys and they've been really sweet to me for the most part i don't have any horrible tales to tell like i've been really blessed by those straight white guys so fuck can me. i ask you what yeah. has it been like in comedy with all of this woke stuff because you guys have to fight off the cancelers too uh, well i'll tell you what was what's really so i'll tell on, on a broad spectrum right remember i said galileo okay first they come after the artists and communism during the soviet union what's the first thing they do they silence the artists the musicians uh-oh then they come after the scientists uh-oh so yeah it's it's uh it's scary it, it's scary and it has affected things you can and cannot say I mean, I, I feel like 10 years ago, I could just say shit and just say it and be like, look, dude, I'm not right. I'm not, I don't know what I am. This is my thought. It's dumb. And here it is. And now you can't, you have, you have to dance around stuff. However, I feel like this year of a pandemic 
has put people put put things in perspective at least the live shows i've been doing suffering chills you the fuck out <laughs> you know what i'm saying like you want to do a good room and comedy do an aa room because those motherfuckers have seen and heard and done everything and they will laugh at anything and i think suffering as collectively we all have as humans this year has broken down so many of us to be like, yeah, well, what do we wait? What am, I, what am I supposed to be mad at this week? I don't even fucking care. And I sense there's a loosening in the clubs, which is great. And I predict I sense a pushback to wokeism. It's coming. It's coming. It's slowly coming. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the backlash will come as more comedians get comfortable and confident like when kevin hart they tried to cancel him for for some joke he told a decade ago he was like i'm not gonna apologize i already apologized mm -hmm. for that shit don't make me apologize again so it's i think it's coming it's just gonna take a few more of us to be like all right dude are we done with this shit because this isn't the way because i do believe in redemption too like how can and how, yeah. like how can you judge anybody else on what they've been saying when you mean to tell me like you haven't said anything stupid or inappropriate or offensive your whole life and you're gonna ruin somebody's career over a tweet? It's just it is it's uh what's the, you the word you use pathology some something else is doing there man. <laughs> well, it's crazy to me because these people are treated as though they are so courageous for going after someone and attacking them, but usually it's just they're doing it for their own gain. Whenever you see the person being brought down and the people who are attacking them are never as successful as them. Woo, boom, you nailed that, Dr. Deborah. So <laughs> that is the absolute truth. They're not happy. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. <laughs> like I go crazy about this. Somebody, in a, some, <laughs> somebody was being promoted to a position of, it was a great position for this young person, okay? And I went to the Instagram account of the, the, the person who had ruined that girl's chance this person that put that other girl on blast for a tweet she did a million years ago and i was like let me see this person is this girl right is she righteous is she really and you look at that instagram and you're like this is the most miserable person mm -hmm. and i actually found myself getting really sad for the the person who canceled the other person and ruined that person's opportunity because i was like dude you're so sad i can it's palpable like you know when you go to someone's instagram feed and you're like you just need a friend. Like, I feel like you guys need a Coke and a smile and like, dude, let's get laid, bro. Oh, like, dude. let's fucking smoke a joint together and I promise you, you will stop this cancel shit tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, maybe we need to put down our phones and like, go get fucking high together and chill. <laughs> you know, right? Deborah, Dr. Deborah, come on. Yeah, or I think in a lot of cases, especially when I see people accusing other people of being hateful, it's usually coming from their own, they're projecting their own hateful views because then when that, then sometimes those people who did the initial canceling get canceled also because people go digging through their social media. <laughs> That's the best. That's it's like, the best. Why did, why did they feel the need in the first place to go after someone? Yeah. So I always question that when I see that. I wonder what their real reasons are. Of course. And, and have you ever in your life, Dr. Deborah So, author of The End of Gender, which you can buy on <laughs> drdebrousseau.com. And get the audio book too. She's got a lovely voice. Very, very smart lady. Thank Have you, you. And you can actually get the audio book free on Audible. Did you hear that shit? You know what I'm saying? Like you have to think about the psychology of these people who are like going after anybody or even writing a negative comment on some free shit on YouTube. Like, can you even imagine a <laughs> world where you would be like, this sucks. We need to get, we need to die. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you doing? Stop yourself. Get into therapy. Stop. Anyway, that's me. Yeah, work on yourself. Work on yourself and be a happy person. Then you won't need to attack other people, strangers on the internet. Yes, and more importantly, your research is confirming what I have been ranting about for years now. <laughs> that the, the gender stuff, it sounded off to me. It didn't sound intuitively correct. So thank you for writing this book, The End of Gender, read it please if you if you have a doubt like hey i just want to even know more about this this sounds weird what is this stuff read it it'll really help you understand it helped me tremendously and more importantly it helps my tiktok feed now i can really <laughs> curate those quality talks that i love awesome i love you so much is there anything else you would like to say promote 
anything? Uh, I just launched my podcast, which is the Dr. Deborah So podcast. I launched that at the start of this month. So I talk to my favorite people, including um, public intellectuals and cultural icons about what's going on in politics. We talk about sex and relationships. My first episode is about selling nudes oh. and what people need to know about before they make this decision because only one side is being presented. So I talk to Eva Lovia, who is a top porn star. And we talk about essentially the reality of making a living that way. Gah. I'm I'm tuning in already. We love that. Mm-hmm. We're on your mom's house. We're fascinated with panty sellers. Do you have any panty <laughs> sellers on your show? I can. <laughs> Please do that and then come back on. Come on your mom's house and then tell us about panty sales. Okay, okay. okay I'll do that. <laughs> Dr. Deborah, so you're the coolest. Thank you so much for coming on. And thank um, you so much. I love yeah, you. You're the best, dude. And when, will you come to Texas one day and have a beer with Joe Rogan and my husband and me? Absolutely. All right. I love you. I love you. Okay. Until next time, stay cool, moms. Bye, meows. Where my mom's, where my mom's, where my mom's at? Where my mom's wearing thongs, hitting bongs at? Raising kids, cleaning shits, need a long nap. Where my mom's, where my mom's, where my mom's at?